We are a bilingual, student-run, peer-reviewed academic journal that provides a forum in which the world's leading scholars exchange ideas on the intersection between law, development, the environment, economics, and society. Uh, if this sounds interesting to you, I encourage you all to check out our website and follow us on Facebook to receive updates on our new articles coming out, our blogs, our upcoming podcast series, and more webinars like this one. So we're gonna go right into introducing our speaker who we are so excited to have with us today. Dr. Iris Goldner Lang is a John Manetz Professor of European Union Law at the University of Zagreb Faculty of Law. She is one of the coordinators of the John Manetz Center of Excellence, EU's Global Leadership in the Rule of Law, the holder of the UNESCO Chair on Free Movement of People, Migration and Intercultural Dialogue, and a member of the steering committee of the UNESCO Unit for Bioethics and Law at the University of Zagreb. She works at the Department of European Public Law, which she chaired from 2013 until 2015. She held visiting positions at Harvard Law School and University College London. And she's also an invited lecturer at the Court of Justice of the European Union, European Parliament, LSE, and other renowned institutions. She is the editor of three books and the author of numerous articles, chapters and books, and an authored book. In short, we are incredibly lucky and honored that Dr. Golder Lang is able to be with us today. So thank you for coming. And if anyone has any questions uh, throughout the presentation, make sure to hold on to them or send them in the chat because we will be having a question and answer period at the end. Okay, I will hand it over to you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Emma. <laughs> you made me blush. <laughs> Uh, so good afternoon, everybody, or good evening, depending on where you are currently. Uh, before I embark on my talk, uh, uh, I would definitely like to thank uh, the McGill Journal of Sustainable Development Law for the invitation. And my special thanks goes to Emma, Eva, uh, and Carla for their impeccable care of all the organizational details. So thank you so much. Now, in the next 30 minutes, my aim is to show the dynamics between the COVID-19 pandemic and the rules imposed as a response to the pandemic, which have impacted free movement of EU citizens, as well as migration and asylum rights of third country nationals in the EU. Next slide, please. Oh, can you put a slide, sorry. <laughs> So we are having a PowerPoint presentation, perfect. So this was just the introduction. So next slide, please. Now, I would like to um, make three crucial points. My first point is that COVID-19 has increased the difference between public health restrictions to free movement rules when compared to restrictions based on public policy and public security grounds, and I will elaborate on that. Uh, my second point is that EU member states mobility restrictions and EU COVID-19 related documents can be viewed as a triumph of precautionary principle. And my last point is that the implementation of precautionary principle has challenged the application of the principle of proportionality in EU law. Now I'm conscious of the fact that some of you have very different backgrounds of EU law and I will explain everything during my talk. Next slide, please. Now, as regards the structure of my presentation, I will follow the usual methodology for analyzing measures impact, impacting the functioning of the EU internal market. I will first identify the COVID-19 restrictions impacting free movement of EU citizens and migration of third country nationals into the EU. I will then move on to the grounds for justifying the use of mobility restrictions. And finally, I will discuss the application of the principle of proportionality to mobility restrictions while linking it to precautionary principle. Next slide, please. Uh, now, my first part of the structure is the identification of COVID-19 mobility restrictions in the EU. So in March, 2020, almost all EU member states 
unilaterally imposed mobility related measures drastically restricting cross-border movement in the European Union. They also enforced lockdowns, which included restrictions on interstate non-essential movements, and they also closed their external borders towards third countries for most non-residents. Interestingly and importantly, all mobility restrictions were adopted nationally by EU member states without being first agreed and coordinated at the level of EU institutions. The European Commission was first reserved towards the idea, but soon they kind of yielded under pressure and the reality, and they started adopting a set of non-binding soft law measures aimed at coordinating national measures and emphasizing the importance of non-discrimination and proportionality in these measures. Next slide, please. The only exception uh, to the general approach of member states' unilateral adoption of mobility restrictions without first reaching a new wide agreement was the closure of external borders towards third countries, which was first agreed at the EU level by the European Council, meaning all EU member states sitting together, and then implemented by each member state separately. The closure of external borders was also accompanied by a spectrum of national measures restricting migrants and refugees' rights, and leading to a temporary halt in the registration and lodging of asylum applications and the right to move in and out of reception centers in a number of member states. For example, um, in March 2020, Hungary suspended admission of migrants to its transit zones, thus effectively suspending access to asylum. And it's striking that Prime Minister Viktor Orban justified the suspension by claiming that there was a clear link between illegal migration and COVID-19. Now, the limited access to EU member states' asylum systems resulted in a drastic lowering of the number of asylum claims. Uh, and it hit the lowest level since 2008 and represented, as you can see on the slide, 87% decrease in comparison to the numbers uh, that were present in January and February 2020, so uh, before the corona crisis started. Next slide, please. Now, as regards the measures impacting free movement of EU citizens, two groups of measures can be identified. First, most Schengen states imposed border checks on their intra-Schengen borders, meaning uh, borders within the Schengen area in between member states. By July the 15th, 2020, 17 out of 26 Schengen states reintroduced internal border controls. And I checked the data today, um, and there are currently nine Schengen states which are having internal border controls. Four of them uh, stated that the reason is the pandemic, but the numbers are con constantly changing. In addition, non-Schengen EU member states, such as Croatia, for example, strengthened their border controls towards neighboring member states. Consequently, in spring 2020, the whole European territory stopped being a border control free area. And this was a strong blow to what used to be considered one of the most important achievements of European integration, the creation of a huge area where you have no border controls. Second, most member states imposed travel restrictions, suspending passenger transport, uh, meaning flights, trains, 
buses and maritime transport. And they also imposed bans on entry and exit to and from national territories. However, these restrictions and bans were often very diverse and sometimes inconsistent with each other. As an example, most entry bans to national territories excluded domestic nationals and residents. However, there were some member states that excluded nationals, residents, and persons confirmed negative on COVID-19, while there were also some member states which excluded nationals, residents, and persons entering the national territories for valid reasons. So there were, there were very inconsistent and diverse practices on who will and will not be admitted to a member state's territory. Now, I'm moving so, so much about the, the measures that were imposed um, across the EU during the pandemic. Now I'm moving to the second part of my, my presentation, which is um, uh, this, uh, the discussion on the grounds uh, for justifying these restrictions that were imposed across the EU. Now, European Union internal market law, meaning free movement rules, allows restrictions to free movement of persons based on grounds of public policy, public security, and public health. Next slide, please. Member states justified the reintroduction of border controls and the imposition of travel restrictions and bans by COVID-19. Now, even though one might have thought logically that COVID-19 is a public health justification, this seems not to be the case in relation to the reintroduction of internal border, uh, border checks or border controls. Let me explain why. If you look at articles 25 and 28 of the Schengen Border Code, which is an EU regulation, uh, these articles tolerate temporary reintroduction of internal border checks in case of a serious threat to public policy or internal security. The code does not mention the reintroduction of internal border controls in case of threats to public health. It's not there. Nevertheless, in its COVID-19 guidelines for border management measures, the European Commission stated, and I quote, and you have the quote on the slide, member states may reintroduce temporary border controls at internal borders if justified for reasons of public policy or internal security. In an extremely critical situation, a member state can identify a need to reintroduce border controls as a reaction to the risk posed by a contagious disease. By this, it seems that the Commission is equating a risk posed by a contagious disease like COVID-19 to an internal security threat. Next slide, please. Unlike the Schengen Borders Code, EU rules on free movement of EU citizens explicitly allow justifying national travel restrictions and entry and exit bans by public health reasons. According to Article 29, Paragraph 1 of the Citizens' Rights Directive, public health grounds can be relied on, and I quote, only for diseases with epidemic potential as defined by the relevant instruments of the World Health Organization and for other infectious or co contagious parasitic diseases if they are the subject of protection provisions applying to nationals of the host member state. So there is no doubt that COVID-19 satisfies these parameters, meaning that public health grounds can be invoked as a legitimate justification for na national travel restrictions and entry and exit bans. However, 
This does not give member states a carte blanche to impose any national restriction in any case of threat to public health. Namely, restrictive measures are admissible only provided they satisfy the principles of non-discrimination and proportionality, which I will address in a moment. Additionally, they cannot be used to serve economic ends. And finally, procedural safeguards, including the right to judicial and administrative redress procedure, should apply to decisions taken on grounds of public health. Next slide, please. Now I would like to discuss the impact of COVID-19 on the use of public health restrictions in EU law. The points that I would like to make are the following. My first point is that COVID-19 has forced us to reconsider our understanding of public health restrictions due to the fact that it has certain characteristics which differentiate it from other infectious diseases we have known so far. And second, and as a consequence of my first point, COVID-19 has increased the difference between the conditions for the applicability of public health restrictions when compared to public policy and public security restrictions. Next slide, please. So let me elaborate on this. According to Article 27, Paragraph 2 of the Citizens' Rights Directive, measures taken on grounds of public policy and public security have to be based exclusively on the personal conduct of the individual concerned. Further, according to the case law of the Court of Justice of the European Union, they cannot be based on general preventive grounds. They cannot be automatic or systematic, and they may be taken only following a case-by-case -case assessment. So these are the general rules applicable to public policy and public security justifications. So the question is, are the same criteria of the existence of personal conduct, case-by-case -case assessment, and in inadmissibility of general preventive grounds and automatic and systematic application also applicable to COVID-19 public health restrictions? And my answer is no, they are not. Why? So COVID-19 has symptoms and is transmitted and spreads in a way which is different from other infectious diseases we have known so far. Consequently, public health restrictions due to COVID-19 could not be based on individualized risk assessment by considering each individual separately based on visible symptoms or the fact that the person has had a confirmed exposure to coronavirus. That doesn't work in the situation that we have with the coronavirus. As a consequence, COVID-19 has triggered the adoption of much more general and systematic restrictions. And it's, it has encompassed, these restrictions have encompassed millions of individuals with, within certain region or within certain member state without regard to confirmed infection or exposure to coronavirus. Next slide, please. So this opens up the question whether more targeted restrictions could have achieved the same result. Now, interestingly, uh, the Commission 1999 communication on Directive 221 from 1964, which is the directive on measures taken on grounds of public policy, public security, and public health, provided that, and I quote, the public health grounds are somewhat outdated 
given the current level of integration of the European Union and the development of new means to handle public health problems. And therefore, restrictions of free movement can no longer be considered as necessary and effective means of solving public health problems. So think of it, this was a communication from 1999, so more than 20 years ago. The 1999 communication refers to this very old directive, which is no longer in force. It was repealed and replaced by a new directive, the Citizens' Rights Directive. And this still does not mean that what was stated in that communication is no longer applicable. Why? Because the Commission communication from 2009 uh, which is the guidance on the Citizens' Rights Directive, confirms that the content of the 1999 communication is still generally valid. Unfortunately, the 2009 guidance does not provide any further guidelines on the use of public health restrictions and justifications. So this leaves us with the questions, are public health grounds outdated today? And do we need new means, such as, for example, mass screening and testing at all border control points and increased contact tracing as a response instead of travel bans that we have had in Europe in spring 2020? Now, the aim of the final part of my presentation is to discuss the application of the principle of proportionality to COVID-19 mobility restrictions and link it to the use of precautionary principle by suggesting that precautionary principle transforms the principle of proportionality. So basically we, are, we have discussed, we have identified the measures we have looked at the just justification, public health justification, and now we are moving to the third step, uh, which is the discussion whether these measures are proportionate. And I want to link the principle of proportionality with precautionary principle. And I will explain why. So let me first provide the general definition of precautionary principle. Precautionary principle, as you can see on my slide, enables decision makers to adopt and legitimize restrictive measures where potentially dangerous effects deriving from a phenomenon, product, or process have been identified for human health, and scientific evidence about the risks are insufficient, inconclusive, and or uncertain. So all these factors, which are the conditions for invoking precautionary principle, the performance of scientific evaluation, the existence of scientific uncertainty, and the identification of negative effects for human health, were satisfied in relation to coronavirus. Consequently, the EU approach towards the COVID-19 pandemic can be viewed as a triumph and a regeneration of what used to be a very much disputed principle. Precautionary principle used to be very much disputed um, and, and its use in general. To illustrate the reliance on precautionary principle in EU COVID-19 related documents, I will cite a statement from the Joint European Roadmap towards lifting COVID-19 containment measures, which provides that, and I quote, the restrictive measures introduced by member states have been based on available information in relation to the characteristics of the epidemiology of the disease and are followed uh, and, and followed a precautionary approach. Additionally, a number of EU COVID-19 related documents I've looked at rely on 
down precautionary approach without explicit mention of the principle itself, but with a number of references to key terms associated to precautionary principle, such as science, risk assessment, risk management, European Center for Disease Prevention and Control, WHO, and so on. Next slide, please. Precautionary principle takes a three-step approach to the risk. The initial step, scientific risk, risk assessment, is performed by scientists, whereas further steps, risk management and risk communication are taken by decision makers, by politicians. The response to the COVID-19 pandemic reflects this interface between science and politics. The first step, scientific risk assessment, was at the EU level performed by the European Center for Disease Prevention and Control, ECDC. Interestingly, when advocating which measures should be used to mitigate the impact of the pandemic, neither the ECDC nor WHO encouraged the use of border closures and travel bans. In one of the COVID-19 related documents that I've put for you on this slide, the ECDC stated that, and I quote, available evidence does not support recommending border closures, which will cause significant secondary effects and societal and economic disruption in the EU. The guidelines further provide that, and again, I quote, border closures may delay the introduction of the virus into a country only if they are almost complete and when they are rapidly implemented during the early phases, which is feasible only in specific contexts, context, for example, small isolated island nations. Similarly, the ECDC risk assessment from the 10th of August 2020 emphasized that, and again I quote, available evidence does not support border closures since COVID-19 cannot be controlled by means of border closures. Nevertheless, despite both the ECDC's and WHO's skepticism towards border closures, as we know, Travel restrictions and bans were adopted in most EU member states, which shows us that the measures rest not on scientists, the final decision whether to impose measures and what types of measures to impose does not rest on scientists, but on decision makers. Next slide, please. Now, how does this relate to the principle of proportionality? And I will first explain to those of you who are not familiar with EU law, what the principle of proportionality in EU law actually means. So EU internal market law tolerates restrictions to free movement only provided they satisfy the principle of proportionality, which entails a three step test. So there are three tests contained within the principle of proportionality. First, based on the suitability test, the restriction has to be suitable for the achievement of the desired aim, such as public health. Second, according to the necessity test, the desired aim, meaning the protection of public health, could not have been achieved by less restrictive means. And thirdly, the restriction needs to be proportionate stricto sensu, meaning that it is reasonable considering other competing interests and the degree of interference to free movement of persons. Next slide, please. Whereas in my opinion, internal border checks, so internal border controls that were introduced within the Schengen area satisfy the principle of proportionality, it is arguable 
whether the same could be claimed for travel bans, so for complete bans of entry and exit, and for certain types of travel bans, not all of them. Now, as regards travel bans, so bans on entry and exit to and from national territories, I would agree that the travel bans are suitable for the protection of public health since they contribute to the reduction of the number of coronavirus infections by minimizing the number of persons uh, that will get in contact and minimizing the number of transmissions. So as regards travel bans, I would claim that the suitability test, so the first test contained in the proportionality analysis is satisfied. However, it is much more difficult whether travel bans satisfy the criteria of necessity, meaning that there couldn't be a less restrictive measure which would achieve the same results and whether it would also satisfy proportionality strict to sense, whether the measure would be reasonable considering other competing interests. Now, due to time constraint, I will not discuss proportionality stricto sensu, but I want to concentrate on the test of necessity, which is particularly difficult. Let me explain why. So just to, to repeat the test of necessity states that the same result could not have been achieved by less restrictive means. So at a time when most EU member states decided to introduce travel bans, and close their external borders towards third countries. The level of knowledge about COVID-19 was not sufficient and conclusive enough to know with certainty that no alternative, less restrictive measures would protect public interest and public health just as effectively. And this is the basis of the criterion of necessity. So scientific knowledge about COVID-19 was not sufficient to determine whether the same result would have been achieved just as effectively through, for example, mass screening, a testing at border control points or via some other means. Additionally, it is questionable whether some of the restrictions applicable to asylum seekers were necessary. That is whether public health could have been protected by less restrictive means and whether these measures were reasonable considering the level of interference with human rights. Consequently, scientific uncertainty associated to COVID-19 disabled the carrying out of the test of necessity as it made it impossible to ascertain with certainty whether a less restrictive measure would have achieved the same result equally successfully. Therefore, scientific uncertainty kind of juxtaposes on the one hand precautionary principle and on the other hand the principle of proportionality. And while scientific uncertainty enables the application of precautionary principle, it at the same time interferes with the principle of proportionality. And this leads me to the last point that I've put um, on one of my initial slides, that the application of precautionary principle transforms the principle of proportionality in EU law by requiring a higher, or sorry, a lower degree of necessity. Next slide, please. To conclude, so COVID-19 has shown how difficult it is to find the right balance between disease control and protection of mobility and other rights. Most importantly, COVID-19 points to the need for better EU level coordination of the internal market and of national public health systems to respond to future health threats. Yesterday, a set of proposals 
by the European Commission was published, um, aimed at strengthening the EU level coordination in cross-border health, uh, cross health care and health threats. And this is a move in the right direction, but we have to wait and see whether it will get support from EU member states. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Goldner Lang. That was so interesting. Um, we're gonna open it up to questions now. Um, does anyone have any questions? Uh, Laura, I see that you have a question. Do you wanna just unmute yourself and go? Sure, thank you so much, Professor, for such a great um, and informative talk. Uh, we really appreciate it. Um, I was wondering if you could speak a little to um, how UNHCR has adopted its policies in, in third countries um, entering for migrants entering, trying to enter into the EU. Mm -hmm. Okay, shall we collect more questions or do you want me to respond immediately? Um, maybe do you want to respond to this one and then give everyone an opportunity to maybe think of some? Okay, sure. So what I, what I know and um, what also had a very negative effect on asylum seekers' right, rights and access to, to, to apply for asylum, to asylum systems in EU member states, is that um, member states, the UNHCR, and the International Organization for Migration temporarily suspended resettlement, the resettlement operations uh, during the, the, you know, the spring uh, pandemic. Um, so basically, this also had a very negative effect on asylum seekers' rights, because basically, you know, first of all, they could not access the EU territory. Uh, once they did access the EU territory, they could actually not apply for asylum, at least for a while in a number of member states. And if they were already in third country, if they were still in third countries, they could not be resettled. So the usual resettlement operations were temporarily stopped or suspended. So, you know, the, the trying to, kind of relate, put this in, in relation to what I talked about. The question is, was this move something that could be kind of justified and whether uh, there were ways to organize resettlement operations in a way uh, that, was, that would still respect the uh, and, and provide all precautionary measures in terms of the epidemiological situation. So I'm definitely not an expert on, on ep the epidemiological situation um, to, to say yes or no, but what I know is that this was also one of the elements in, in the whole puzzle, in the whole picture that made asylum seekers during the coronavirus crisis extremely vulnerable. Great, thank you so much. We have another question from Emily. Hi, yes. I was just wondering if you know if there has been any research or if you yourself have conducted any research into the specific um, the specific consequences of these of this curtailment of mobility rights on the Romani people present in the EU. Can you sorry uh, the, the the it's I cannot hear you well. Can you repeat? I was wondering if you yourself or if you know of anybody else who has been conducting research into the specific consequences of this curtailment of mobility rights for the Romani people within okay. the EU. All right. I haven't done any research on this. I'm not acquainted uh, with any particular research on this point. I'm sure there has been some. Um, definitely, I know at least that some international uh, organizations and also in my country, in Croatia, some NGOs 
have been following the developments and looking at different categories of vulnerable people. So I suppose that, you know, if you want to find some research on that, the best would be to look at their research, to look at different international organizations and, and, and different NGOs, what they have found out. So that would be my suggestion. But I, unfortunately, I cannot pinpoint particular research for you. Hey, thank you. Um, oh, we just received a question in the chat. Um, I can read it out if you would like. So the question is, would it be possible for member states to justify preventive quarantine measures states with respect to asylum seekers in reception centers on the basis of the precautionary principle? Moreover, is it possible to argue that measures of quarantine fall under the exclusive competence of the member states on the basis of Article 168 in the TFEU? Because, for example, measures of quarantine and isolation are not addressed in the reception conditions directive. Okay, so thank you for the question. Now, as regards the, the, the situation in reception centers, um, that was also one of the critical points, weak points in the whole situation, due to the fact that many reception facilities in different member states were overcrowded. So you had overcrowded facilities which were not properly equipped to put in place adequate preventive measures. Um, so, you know, if you had a case and there were cases where coronavirus entered a reception center, it spread really easily within the reception center. Um, so, you know, because simply there were too many people there. So it was very difficult to put in place proper epidemiological measures. So as a consequence, I would say, um, there were cases where users of reception centers were actually kind of locked down in the center to prevent further transmission. Um, I know that there was a, a coronavirus infection that occurred in a German reception center where half of the people who were there, I think there were around 600 people, tested positive. And they were all placed uh, uh, in the lockdown. Uh, now, you know, your question is whether this is okay, right? Whether this is something that could be a measure which would be covered by the precautionary principle. I would definitely say yes. Now, the big question is, is the measure proportionate? Because the principle of proportionality does not only apply to uh, within the domain of EU internal market law, meaning free movement of EU citizens, but it also applies to any measure that the European Union or its member states actually adopt. So measures have to be proportionate, meaning that while wanting to protect the health of the people who were in the reception centers and the people around the reception centers, you have to consider whether the same result of protecting human health could have been achieved by less restrictive means, right? Um, by, by measures which were less coercive, which did not go into human rights violations so much. And would that be something that would fall under exclusive competence of member states, meaning that you know you are allowed to do whatever you want to in reception centers, absolutely not. So this is something that's covered uh, by the EU obligation, by member states' obligations um, based on on EU asylum law and the Charter, right? So you know the basic uh, human decency of those people has to be respected whenever you are. Um, you are adopting measures which are within the domain of EU law. And I would definitely argue that this is one of the cases because the way people are treated, asylum seekers are treated, is something that should be covered 
by 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 EU asylum law. Yeah, absolutely. So I wouldn't go in the direction of claiming this is exclusive national competence. Great, thank you. And then we had a question from MJSL Management. I'm not sure if it's Ava or Carla. Yeah, it's me, it's Carla. Um, I just had a question about, uh, you brought up the precautionary principle and how it's been viewed sort of critically in the past prior to its use, use during COVID. Um, can you go into like when this principle first arose in EU, in EU history and how it's been used in the past by the EU? Yeah. So, you know, the precautionary principle started being used in the European Union, you know, the mad cow disease that erupted in Europe many, many years ago. And this is when the European Union and its member states recognized that there, there are situations when you shouldn't put um, kind of products on the market which might be risky, even though you might not be sure uh, if there is a risk to human health or to the environment or to animal health, you should try to avoid the risk uh, by simply not putting the product the, on the market. So precautionary principle does not only apply to measures which could have very negative effects for human health, but also for the environment and also for animal and plant health. And Usually, precautionary principle, if you look at the past measures of precautionary principle, it's been used as a way in an active way, meaning we decide to use the precautionary principle by not putting um, a certain product on the market, by banning it from the market. And what we are having here with regard to coronavirus is something different. Because with regard to coronavirus, we are deciding um, to act actually prior to, you know, we are trying to eliminate the consequences, but in a different way, I would say. Now, precautionary measures were also used. Um, you, you, are, you don't remember, you are too young, but in 2003, there was a SARS uh, pandemic. Uh, or epidemic um, in Europe. Um, and there were some precautionary measures put in place, but you know, the level of restrictions that were put in place were just incomparable to the restrictions that have been adopted now with regard to coronavirus. So 17 years ago, we had uh, a similar situation, but you know, on, on a scale from one to 10, that would probably be one or two, and this is 10. Um, and precautionary principle is viewed as something that uh, Europe has been promoting and which has very negative effects on innovation. And think of products. So you, so you have a novel product and you are not sure whether it will have negative effects so until you are completely sure, you are not putting it on the market, yeah? And you are therefore possibly stopping a product which is fine, but you don't want to risk it. And you are consequently kind of slowing down the innovation. And there was always a discussion that Europe has this kind of precautionary approach and that it has a lot of negative side effects primarily stopping and slowing down innovation, whereas the US, on the other hand, is taking a completely different principle. And I was really interested to read that one of the very strong critics, the US critics of precautionary principle, Cass Sunstein, who I'm sure you all know, and who's professor at Harvard Law School, stated, um, I think for New York Times or somewhere, I read it somewhere on the media, uh, when the whole, uh, COVID-19 pandemic erupted, that precautionary approach is the right approach with regard to the coronavirus. So that's why I'm saying that, you know, COVID-19 represents a kind of a triumph, a regeneration, a precautionary approach, because now it was considered to be the only, the best choice to save lives. Great, 
Okay, thank you so much. That's very interesting. I had a bit of a follow up. Um, you mentioned that the precautionary um, principle has been used in cases where something might have negative effects on the environment. Um, since we are a sustainability journal, I just thought I'd ask, is this something that's used a lot in environmental law to protect um, the environment to prevent, you know, products that might be damaging to the environment from circulating on the market? So it has been used in EU law uh, in, in, in the European Union and the uh, precautionary principle is explicitly mentioned in the EU primary law with regard to the environment. So if you look at the EU treaties, the, the EU primary law, the European Union does not have a constitution but has treaties Precautionary principle is not there, it's not mentioned with regard to the protection of public health, but it is explicitly mentioned with regard to the environment. So yes. Okay, that's really interesting, thank you. We have another question in the chat um, that I'm just gonna read out. So it is from someone who is writing from Italy and they are saying that lots of people in their country are arguing that ports should be closed as well as land and air borders. How do you think that we should manage the Mediterranean situation at this particular time? Yeah, okay. So when it comes to travel restrictions that were imposed uh, by a number of EU member states that also included maritime transport, um, and I know that as regards uh, asylum seekers um, in spring, I don't know when exactly, but sometime in spring, probably around March 2020, Greece and Cyprus temporarily suspended asylum applications as well, just like Hungary, but you know, to a different degree, I would say. Whereas Italy and Mal Malta, which are Mediterranean states primarily, announced that their ports cannot be classified as safe places for asylum seekers. So, you know, there was in Italy, and maybe Ludovica could tell us more about it because she's from Italy, but there was in Italy and Malta, uh, these are the cases that I know that I've read of, uh, this recognition that coronavirus could also come into the country and spread by people arriving uh, via ports. And therefore they, they tried to stop the asylum seekers uh, from arriving uh, via, via the Mediterranean Sea. And they said, okay, we want to suspend this for a while. Thank you so much. I also have a bit of a follow-up to that question, if that's all right as well. You mentioned Greece and Hungary in particular, and I, those are countries, especially Hungary, that have been experiencing a lot of xenophobia and reluctance to admit migrants and refugees. To what extent do you think they're taking advantage of this public health crisis in order to formally like close their borders and kind of not have to fulfill their obligations under the Refugee Convention? Okay. So yeah, this is a very good question. And um, I'm sure that all of you have been following what's going on in Hungary. Um, which, you know, there is a huge threat to the rule of law there in so many aspects, and there is rising xenophobia. Uh, and I've uh, quoted for you what the Prime Minister Viktor Orban, the Hungarian Prime Minister, stated when suspending um, all asylum applications um, as a response, that's what he claimed, to the coronavirus pandemic. He said that there was a clear link between uh, illegal migration and the spread of coronavirus. So, you know, I would say, I would, I would kind of put it into the perspective. When you look at a number of statements by Viktor Orban, this is just one that really kind of, uh, this is something that you could expect coming from him. I remember that uh, after the Paris terrorist attack, um, several years ago, he stated that all terrorists are migrants. So what he's doing by his rhetoric is basically uh, sending a message that migration is a bad thing because it's very risky. It's risky in terms of terrorism. It's risky because of uh, protection of human lives. 
and we should stop it in any possible way. So he's trying, he's abusing the situation to kind of close Hungary as much as possible. That's, of course, this is only my opinion, but I'm not the only one. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Um, we have one more question in the chat and then maybe we can wrap up because I don't want to take up too much of your time than what you promised. So there's another person who is also writing from Italy and they would like to ask if you think that there could be some room for the application of the solidarity principle for the evaluation of the EU legitimacy of some national circulation bans. Uh, for example, migration, see Article 80 of the TFEU. Okay, so yeah, so Article 80 of the Treaty on the Functioning of the European Union is an article stating that member states should help each other. So this, it, 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 it kind of um, promotes the principle of solidarity among EU member states in the area of migration and asylum. Um, and the question, let me just look at it carefully. The question is whether the principle of solidarity could be used, but in terms of, I'm not sure what's the link with the coronavirus. Can you help me? Capuano, can you, can you maybe elaborate on your question? Hello, hello, good evening. Hi. Um, okay, my question comes from a research. I'm uh, carrying on the solidarity principle. Okay, so uh, I would really be interested uh, to understand if also the principle of solidarity that in the last period, especially with the coronavirus, is going to enforce is uh, often uh, um, called by also the ECJ, could also play a role as not just uh, uh, a very abstract principle, but to evaluate, uh, I, I think that uh, I'm completely agree with you uh, with the application of a precautionary principle uh, when we speak about, uh, for instance, uh, the, uh, the travel ban. But when we speak about some, tr some circulation ban within the migration context, Maybe we should make a, a more uh, um, balance, a little bit more uh, focused also on other interests such as solidarity. That is my point of view that I, I want to know about yeah. the legitimacy of this principle and the uh, legitimacy of a, a national uh, vision, national uh, uh, measures and this principle. Okay, so as regards uh, migration and the principle of solidarity, there have been different attempts to promote the principle of solidarity in the area of migration and asylum, meaning that member states, uh, which are not that much exposed to migration and asylum because they are not creating the external EU borders towards third countries, that they help uh, the, the states which are creating the external borders by relieving the pressure from that, both in terms of taking some of the asylum seekers and moving them, relocating them to their national territories or also by financial help. And uh, during the asylum, uh, the refugee crisis in 2015, 2016, two relocation decisions were adopted and the idea was to, uh, to relocate from Greece and Italy tens of thousands of migrants and asylum seekers who arrived there. Uh, unfortunately, um, the result was really, really sad, I would say, because most member states relocated just a tiny part of the quotas that they agreed upon in the relocation decisions. And three states, including, of course, Hungary, did not relocate a single person, okay? Now, what is going on today as we speak um, is that there is a new package of legislative proposals in the area of asylum put forward by the European Commission 
It's called the New Pact on Migration and Asylum, and you can Google for it and search all the documents. And you will see that it kind of puts a lot of stress on solidarity again. And the commission is conscious of the fact that certain member states will never agree to having quotas for allocation of asylum seekers to their countries. So Hungary or um, Estonia, or I don't know, certain countries will simply say, no, 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 we are not agreeing to any quota. And then what the commission is proposing is the following. They're saying, all right, then member states can choose how they want to execute the principle of solidarity towards the most pressured member states like Italy and Greece. And there are several ways they can do it. They can either do it through relocation, or if they don't like it, they can do it through something that is called return sponsorship, meaning that they will organize the return to third countries of people who do not qualify for asylum. Um, and I have my doubts whether this is going to work. This is still a proposal, so it's on the table. It's been uh, published by the Commission on the 23rd of September, so it's brand new. Now, how does this relate to the COVID-19 pandemic? I would say that it makes, the pandemic makes the whole, the whole solidarity problem even more complicated. Because then you could argue, well, we have to take you know, certain precautions, of course, and take care of uh, epidemiological uh, situation. For that reason, we cannot relocate as many people and so on. So the principle of solidarity, unfortunately, is still far away from what its potential are, potentials are in migration and asylum. And I hope it's going to change. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much. We've already kept everyone a little bit longer than promised. So I think that we will wrap up, up now, but thank you so much, Professor Goldner Lang for your talk and for answering all of our questions. I think that we all really learned a lot. So we really appreciate your time. Thank you so much. Thank you and take care and all the best to all of you. Thank you so much.